Hey, everybody, everybody, Strong Inspirations is coming at you once again. Oh, my God. And we are in the national. I don't just talk to people in America. I talk to people around the world so that I can give you this Black history for sure. And people around the world know about America and they all got their own little bit of form, their big form of history, Black history. And then they love America anyway. I don't care what you say, we the number one in the world. No question about it, at least that's, you know, my own biased opinion, you know what I'm saying? But nonetheless, I got a lady on the channel today. She's from the UK, the United Kingdom. And she gonna talk about a lady in America. I mean, they study us, right? But before we get to that, I gotta let you know, I got a movie out. It's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. I got 75 minutes of powerful, powerful black history in my film. And in the UK, it's on Amazon where you it's streaming over there. Unbelievable. I'm just an ordinary guy doing my thing. And then I got this book called Black Business Book, which has, it really complements the, uh, the movie, the documentary. Uh, this one got more facts though. You know, I really get in on it. Ooh, ah, ooh, I, ooh, I, I blow your mind. And uh, and people in the UK can even uh, read my book online too. And I'm trying to figure out ways to get hard copies over there. And you know, that's gonna happen because I'm kind of a, a, a innovative kind of guy. I'm a, a a little bit of a go getter type dude, right? So. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, is a, a big out of America, and I'm sure it's big out of the UK and Europe and all over there, is jazz music. I I I, I like jazz. When I'm when I'm working and I'm writing and I'm on the internet and all that, a lot of times I have jazz music in the background because it kind of soothes my mind. And there has been some huge jazz artists across the years, and we're going to talk about one today. And so uh, I'll let her tell it. She's going to, come, come on, lady, let, introduce yourself. Let's, let's get it on. Let's get it in a smooth way. So I introduce myself. My name is Julia Blackburn. I live in England in the country near the sea. I've been writing books for a long time, but in 2005, I like writing books about people who I care about in one way or another. People who matter to me and have mattered to me often for a long time. And in 2005, I published a book called With Billy. And I first came across Billy Holiday when I was about 14 at a very wild party. I came from a very bohemian family and it was quite scary. All the people were, were too wild for me, but I, Somebody put on the record, Billie Holiday Memorial, with a picture of this woman I didn't know on the cover wearing a white dress and looking very, she had that sort of wonderful tight look that she was concentrating hard. And I listened to the songs and the Billie Holiday Memorial starts with the Columbia days and it goes right through to Verve and to her last records. And even though it's so long ago, since I'm so old now, but I, it completely, shifted something in me because what Billie Holiday did in that song, in that singing, was that she spoke to me. She gave me, and she somehow gave me a voice as well. She'd sing happy songs, and yet there was an edge of sadness. She'd sing sad songs, and from the sad songs, you could think, yeah, I can do it. I can get okay, through. Let, let, let me, let me stop you there. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me stop you there. How you get to hear Billie Holiday? How did she get over there? You, they, at that time, it was records, right? All records, yes. Okay, so she, the, there was yeah. somebody selling her records in the in the, in 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 the United K in the UK. I think that I mean you find it in Billie Holiday's life. 
that she was more often more famous in in Europe and in the UK than she was allowed to be, shall we say, in America. She was she was recognized before, you know, in the 50s, in the 40s, that people really treasured her records. And since then, even then at that time, if you went into bars, cafes, she's gone on being played. And still now, I used to live in Amsterdam. You'd go into bars in Amsterdam. She always, always, her voice has survived time. So that was just then, that would have been in, if I was 14, I, uh, 58, 68, would have, um, it would have been about 19, I don't know, 60, something like 62. Okay. 62. Let, let, me, let me ask you this question. Was there a, a jazz station that you listened to that played her music or did it just have to be the records? It was just, I don't know. I never listened to the rec to, to, to music at that time on, on the radio. I bought the record. I was a 14 year old. I went out the next day and bought the record. And after that, I bought every record. I got the kind of the, um, the, all the Columbia records. I got the Verve records. And after that, I learnt, I could sing all her songs when I could still sing, not with a good voice, but I knew all the songs. And I just kept her with me all my life. And then finally thought, I'm going to write about her because I didn't like the way she was written about. Okay. I felt she wasn't given the right respect and admiration in the way that people wrote on the back of a record or something. Okay. So I wanted to fight her corner a bit. That was my thought. Okay. So now you, you're listening to her music. Did, did you ever see her perform live? She died in 58. Oh, she died she in 58. Okay. Yes, and she came to England. In, no, she came to Europe in 1957, but then I was only nine. Okay, I, I got you. I wish well, we're I not going to add up the years. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I wish I had, I'd have liked, I'd have liked, I did meet people, a couple of people who'd known her, but I never met her. I got you. I got you. Yeah. So now, um, her music was more of a, what type of style? It was more of a bluesy type style. What would you say her style was? I don't think, I mean, she sang blues sometimes and she's talked about as a blues singer, but really she was a torch singer. She was a singer who sang, you know, she sang the same kind of songs as Frank Sinatra sang before he did. She took on really good sort of, um, what it is called torch songs, isn't it? Things like, like What a Little Moonlight Can Do or, or um, Back in Your Own Backyard. They're really, um, they're not blues their songs, but she sings them with such, such a particular intensity that they speak to everybody. I got you. Now, do you, do, you, uh, do you know some of her background of how she grew up and where she grew up and that kind of thing? Yes, of course I do, yes. Okay. So she was born in 1915 in Baltimore. And that was a very tough place to be born in 1915. Her mother, Sadie, um, and she was, was, it was a rough life. It was a rough life. She then, she started as a kind of, she became a bit of a truant. She had a, she had a difficult childhood, putting it mildly. But what she discovered was that she started going to the bars and the, and the whole houses, the bars, and there she first heard the good singers. She heard Bessie Smith, she heard Louis Armstrong, and she discovered at a very early age, by the time she was about 11 or 12, she, had, she realized she had a voice. And so she would go there and she would start singing. And then when her mother went to New York, when Billy was, gosh, I think 14, 13, 14, she'd been put in care homes, she'd been, um, she'd been put in an orphanage. She'd had a, you know, really rough deal. But she goes to New York where her mother is living in a brothel court with, run by a woman called Florence Williams. And Billy goes to live there with her. She's again sent off to a reformatory or something for a year, which she hates, obviously. But then she comes back and she discovers that actually she can make a living singing. So she starts singing in the, I think it's the hotspot first in Harlem. And um, that from that moment on, that, that means that she's got a way, she's got a pathway to make herself a life that is going to survive, a life that's going to be good in the way of, you know, she's got a voice. She's got a voice and that voice is going to carry her as far as it has. And her voice 
right from the start. She's, it's extraordinary, her voice. And she gets taken on by a, a, a guy called John Hammond. And so by the time she's, I can't remember, I think she's 20 or 18 or something, she gets a big contract with Columbia Records and she does four, I think it is, or more records, big LPs with them. So, so, so John Hammond, is he, is he the guy who discovers her? Who discovers her? How does she, how does she get discovered by the record label? John Hammond. Oh, so he's, John. He hears her. He's the same guy who found Bob Dylan later. Yeah. Okay. Um, he's uh, he was, he had a, he was listening to music in, in Harlem and he heard her singing and he very wisely realized that she had something very special. Um, and so he got her a contract. Yeah. Um, probably not a very well paid contract, but yeah. a contract all the same. Yeah. And she was very, very popular because she had this, she had a different way of singing to other people. Now, you know, a lot of times when you hear people getting contracts, it seems like um, maybe it just happens almost overnight where the right person comes along and says, okay, I like you, let's do it. Is that kind of how it happened to her? She just happened to be in a bar or she did you was, think he followed her with, for a little while? She was with all the good people. So she was playing with, with all the top jazz people realized that she'd got a, a voice. So at, and at that time in Harlem, where are we now? We're in the, in the 30s in Harlem. Then you've got really the top jazz musicians uh, all over the place. You know, there's, there's um, I, I can't think of the particular ones who she, but the, who's the pianist? Not Bobby Tucker, but the other one. There's Lester Young is around, and there's the pianist who she plays with all the time, whose name escapes me briefly. But so that she's wherever you go to the good um, jazz spots, she's going to be there and she's going to be singing. And bit by bit, she starts, she gets more and more successful in the way of um, where she sings. I'm trying to think. And she so this is like in her 20s, you say? She's in 27, so she's born in 50, in 15, 20, um, 15, now she's still quite young. She's still in her late teens when she's getting, trying to think when she gets started with, she plays with Bobby Henderson um, and she plays with the other things, but by the time she's 20, she's a, a big name. Oh, is she? She's doing well in the, within that world. So okay. in, in wait a minute, she's born in 16, 26, 36, and her big, so that by the time in 1939, so then she's 20, then she's the big attraction in this first properly mixed race cafe society jazz club run by somebody called Barney Jovisson. And she's the top singer there. And that's where you have, she's got, she's, she's at a kind of high point in her career. Yeah. Let, let me, let me go back. Is Billie Holiday her real name or is that a stage name? I just, that yeah. question just came her up. Father, her father was called Clarence Holiday and her mother was called, I forget her surname. Her mother was called Zadie, but she took on her, although her mother and father weren't married, she took on the name of Holiday from her father. Um, otherwise her name was Goff. That's right. I that's got you. I got Goff. you. So now she goes along in her career and things are kind of going smoothly. Does she have, uh, does she get married and have uh, kids or any of that? Things don't go very smoothly for Billie Holiday, no. I mean, the thing is that she's, the first thing that happens, she's at Cafe Society, which is a very much sort of a, a, um, a sort of very interesting place. It's where they have, they have very good music and they have, as I say, they have, both white and, and African-American people go there together. So it's a kind of breakaway from that earlier time. And when she's there in 1939, it is that she's there singing every night, people come and see her. She meets somebody who, who, whose name is Lewis Allen, who's written a song which he wrote as a kind of protest song for his family and because he was, he, he was a civil rights man, white Jewish guy. He'd written a song called Strange Fruit. You know Strange Fruit? Uh, I don't know the song, no. You don't. Strange Fruit is the most, it's an incredibly important song. It's about lynching. Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood on the root. Okay. It's a very, very tough song, but a beautiful, how he's, it's beautifully written. 
she sings that song so powerfully that people start coming to hear it and they send it. It's the first civil rights statement. It's a really strong statement. And because of that, she suddenly, although she's not a speaking political person, she becomes a person who's got a political power because she sings this song. Um, and so from that, they, they send all, they send copies. A record is produced of it. Copies are sent to everybody in Congress, to all the senators, all the things, as a way of making a statement. And with that, then she gets into trouble with the narcotics agency and the FBI. And after that, life gets very complicated for her. Now, hold on, go back. She, so after the song, uh, what happens again? She, she gets in trouble? She, they, they don't want, it's, it's too strong a song. It's too much of a, of a song with a, with a message about, um, about, about the nature of the Deep South. So the people, the FBI, the narcotics people, they try and stop her from singing it. And because she's got this, she's a, she's a very feisty woman, but she's got this, she, they say, you know, leave it off, leave off singing it and we'll leave you alone. She doesn't leave off, this is simplifying, she doesn't. She goes on singing this song. And from that point on, and she's also making quite a bit of money as well. From that point on, she gets hounded by the FBI and by the narcotics agency and her life gets troubled. And like many other people within the jazz world, she starts by smoking marijuana because that was legal and then that's made illegal or it's made the same stuff as the same illegality as heroin. She sometimes has heroin, just as many of those people do, but she becomes the, the figure to be chased and to be, to be made, you know, to be given trouble. So from that time, she's got a very troubled life. So now, uh, if you could estimate from the, the time the song comes out to the time that she gets in trouble, um, that might be a year or two and then another year or two before uh, she really starts getting on the drugs, or what would you say? It's that from the time when she sings the song and people in the cafe society come and listen to it, then she's in trouble, sort of in that same year, because she's then making a statement that people don't want to hear, and she's the people in the kind of um, the intellectual lot, society, the artists, the people, they're with her, the other lot are against her. Do you, do you, uh, would, would you imagine uh, that her career would have went differently and she would have lasted a longer time if she had not sang that song or that might have been just her destiny? Can you, what would you think? Destiny, if she, the thing was that she, she was, if she had not been so given so much trouble she was, she was a very, very interesting singer. She did a very, she got, um, how can I put this? If she'd been, if she hadn't been hounded so much and had lived to a great life, she'd have, you know, to a long life, then her singing would have evolved and, in, and possibly also politics would have got better. So she could have been a grand old lady of song. As it was, she died in 58, so then she was only, 16, 26, 36, 46. She was not yet, she was just over 40 when she died. Oh. Um, so she, it, it was, she had a very, very troubled life. She was sent to prison. She was arrested on a drugs charge. She was sent to prison for a year. She came out and friends of hers in, made her, she then appeared at Carnegie Hall and had two, two nights at Carnegie Hall to an absolute sellout. There were people queuing, but at that same time, she lost what was called her cabaret card. Do you know about the cabaret card? No, I don't know. The cabaret card is that if you, if you wanted to sing in, in New York, which was her place, she was a New York woman, if you wanted to sing there, you had to have a cabaret card to sing in clubs and cafes. If you didn't have that, you couldn't sing in them. So from that time, when she came out of prison, they took out her cabaret, took away her cabaret car, but they did say, if you stop singing Strange Fruit, we'll give it back to you. But she went on singing Strange Fruit, she lost her cabaret card. So it meant she had to be on tour away from New York and the strain was tremendously tough. 
she was she had a very tough life did did she uh after after that song and whatever album that song whatever album that song was on did she record other music she did she's done she's i've got what you, you can get i've got a kind of a, a set of late, her late recordings i've got in one thing which i think is 12 cds she sang and she sang and she sang. She's there. There's the Columbia Years, which is one lot, which is about again. I think if you have all the complete, it's about twelve CDs. Then there's the Verve recordings, which is maybe another twelve CDs. Then there's another lot towards the end of her life. She just was singing all the time. Wow. And being recorded, she was and, brilliant. And so, how? I don't know if you said this. How, how did she die? She died, she was drinking a lot, she was in a lot of trouble. Somebody called William Dufty wrote a book about her called Lady Sings the Blues, which was said to be an autobiography, but she said she'd never read it. But he made a big show about all the drug stuff and made it into a, he did a very, I think he, he, was, he did a, a great disservice to her. Anyway, she then, she was in, had very hard times but she was always admired in Europe. So she went to Europe once and came to England, I think in 1956 and then 57, she went to France and other places. But when she came back, she was arrested because they said she hadn't got permission to leave America because she'd been a felon. And they threatened to send her again to prison and she couldn't cope with that. She started drinking very heavily and then she and she was she just couldn't cope and she got ill and she died in hospital. So she so she she just died from natural causes from the abuse to her body, though. I mean, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah she, would, they, would they say it might have been almost suicide or something like that? Well, if an, if a drunk is a suicide, then yeah. yes. Or if somebody who takes if somebody abuses their body just through too much drunk, you know, drink or drugs or whatever. But then at the same time, if they're given a chance to, I say this as the daughter of an alcoholic, <laughs> but if they're given enough chance to get through, then I the body can recover. I, I got mean, you. She, sort of, she, I think she said, she said to somebody when she was in the last year of her life, she said, if you've been hounded like I've been hounded, you'd be drinking all the time too. I got you. She I guess a, as we come to a close, what would you say was the height of her career? Was it that song or prior to that song? Oh, no, I think, well, there's two, she has three heights, I would say. The Columbia records are fantastic, joyful, beautiful songs, which reached a height. Strange Fruit stands as a separate record because it's a political statement of incredible power. And then in her later life, her voice was sort of cracked, but it's fantastic, beautiful voice. And sometimes when she couldn't sing, she was too, she couldn't get to sing. Even if she recites a song, it's beautiful. She was a great, she was a, she, she, she can't, you can't say more than she was a, a fun. I always think they should have a Billie Holiday street, a Billie Holiday stamp, but because she got stuck with this image of being using drugs and, and you know, going downhill, <coughs> which I don't, which I think was exaggerated, as I said. Right. She wasn't given, she's great. She was a great woman, and she's still, when you hear her now, you must listen to her. Right. She is, I think, the best woman singer who ever was, best female singer who ever my, was. I guess my last question was there, besides her music career, is she, um, did she do something like donate money to orphanages, or no, did she have other I'm causes afraid. that she dealt with? She didn't keep her money. She had managers who took her money from her. She didn't get any. She had no money. It came and went. I mean, she had a mink coat um, and she did high, you know, she did big performances, but she had terrible managers who, who um, always they they made and took and lost the money. And she was always at the end of her life. She was almost penniless. She was almost, really almost is, is last question. Is she uh, besides that song? Is she no? Well, I guess that song is what what is she's more known for her music or her 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 uh, her her revolution attitude as a result oh, no, of that song? Known, no, no, she's known for well, she's known for her music, for her singing, for her, for her the entertainment power of her music, 
And Strange Fruit is just a, another one, one solitary thing where she says one statement. She makes one statement about politics very strongly. And that's, there's a whole book written, there are several books I think written just about Strange Fruit. But, yeah. but, but as, a, as a performer, she has these stages where her voice changes, but it's her music that has survived beyond all else. Oh. It, do you 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 wrote a book about it? Do you have a copy of the book there that you can show us? This is the English edition. The American edition is different, but that's the English edition in paperback. Oh, can you? See I it? see. And it's available and it in America on Amazon. You can get it. It had a very nice write-up by Tony Morrison. Do you know Tony Morrison? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Who said this addition to the tide of Billy Holiday books? is very welcome. Nowhere else is the context of her life and work so vividly captured. So she was, I was trying to see, because I'm not an American and I'm not a jazz person and I'm not, not African-American, I got no qualifications. I could come to it from the outside and just look at it. And I did a lot of trying to understand the society that she was in. And that was what, the, so, and I had to do the book. I got hold of a collection of interviews that were made in the 70s. There's now films being made about these interviews, but I got hold of this collection of interviews made in the 70s. So the book is like a, everybody's speaking about her with a different voice. So it's Lester Young or um, what's his name? The, the, you know, different musicians, or different, also FBI people, all the rest speak about her. So you get a kind of overall picture of what yeah, she was you. like, and there we are. Well, hey, I uh, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day as you a prolific writer, uh, internationally known, to to write about uh, Billie Holiday as you have, uh, but uh, to, you know from the bottom of my heart to come on strong inspirations. Uh, would everybody, you, would, you, would you do one thing for me? One yes. thing you must do for me. You're now going to go and listen to her on YouTube. Yeah, I sure am. Do that. Listen thing. to Billie Holiday. Listen to Fine and Mellow. Go and listen to Fine and Mellow. Yes. Okay. In fact, there's something, there's one thing on YouTube, I think, where I'm talking about Fine and Mellow. But listen to her singing Fine and Mellow. Listen to her singing something like um, Them, Their Eyes, and Strange Fruit. And then you'll be a fan. Forever. Okay. Yeah. Everybody, that's what we're going to do. Good, good. We're hey, going to listen to good. Billie Holiday. Thank you so very much for coming on Strong Inspirations. Everybody, I'm telling you, I bring it to you straight, no chaser. I let them tell it from even across the pond, as they call it. <laughs> even across the way over there. They come on there. Strong Inspirations to tell us some good information. Thank you so very much. Come on, folks. Right. Hit that subscribe <laughs> button. Hit that like button. Hit the notifications bell. Tell somebody about Strong Inspirations. And please stay strong, stay safe, have a beautiful day. Uh, thank you for coming on the channel. Bye-bye, uh, everybody. We out. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.